Welcome back. This lesson is exciting because this is our first official forensics lesson. So we are starting with our observation skills lesson. So this particular unit is called introduction to forensics. This is where we talk about crime scene processing. We are taking on the role of forensic investigators in this unit and we are trying to understand what it is that they do, how forensics works as a whole, and how evidence when found at a crime scene can make its way into the courtroom. So the very first lesson of this unit is observation skills and we're gonna start with a little observation skills uh, activity so I'm gonna give you just a second or two to glance at this image soak it all in because I'm gonna ask you some questions and we're gonna test your observation skills so here we go uh, find you a scratch sheet of paper pause the video if you need to grab you a scratch sheet of paper see what you can answer on these questions all right so number one what color was the truck that was in the picture? Number two, there were two light poles. What did the sign say that was posted on the first light pole? Number three, there was a speed limit sign. Do you remember what the speed limit was? Number four, what did the sign on the second light pole say? Number five, what was the make and the model of the van that was approaching the truck? And then number six, did the truck have a passenger? Number seven, what time of day do you think this photo was taken. All right, let's go back and see how you did. I want you to tally up how many questions you got right. So the first question asked what the color of the truck was. Hopefully you said blue. Uh, and then the second question asked what the sign on the first light pole said. And this one was difficult to see, but if you guessed yard sale, you were correct. The speed limit was the next question. Uh, what was the speed limit? So that was 35 miles per hour. The next question asked about the sign on the second light pole, and that was a no parking sign. The next question asked if the truck had a passenger, and the answer is yes. You can see his arm sort of hanging out the window there. Uh, the next question asked about the van that was approaching the truck, and that's a Dodge Caravan. And uh, this photo was actually taken at 11 a.m. So if you guessed 11 a.m. or around about that time, you were correct. So why did we do this little exercise? Well, we were testing our observation skills. And since this topic today is over observation skills, uh, I just wanted to test and see if you felt like you had good observation skills. We're gonna do several things throughout the next couple weeks to sharpen our observation skills because we are gonna learn that observation skills are acquired skills. Forensic investigators, eyewitnesses, victims, um, our brains are just not designed to remember everything that we see. We have to practice having good observation skills. So we're gonna do that over the next couple of weeks. So the first thing that you need to write in your notes, and by the way, if you are one of my students, I have provided you with notes. If not, make sure that you get all of this information down um, in the form of notes. Feel free to pause the video as you need to. The first thing you need to write down is that forensic investigators must rely on their ability to observe, interpret, and report observations clearly. So they're just not going into a crime scene and looking around and then they're done. They have to make those observations, but then they have to make perceptions about those observations, which we call interpretation. And then they have to report that information clearly in a way that if it ever makes it to the courtroom, a jury can listen and understand the interpretations of the investigators. Forensic examiners have to be able to identify evidence. They have to find it uh, through their observations and then they have to record it and they also have to determine its significance. So is this something that's significant to solving the crime or is this what we call extraneous evidence? 
Now, this is often difficult, and the reason why is because human error is always a possibility. Again, the brain is just not designed to take in all the information that bombards us every day. And so what happens uh, as a result is investigators can make faulty perceptions. We'll talk about this in just a second. They may miss information that is important. Or in the case of like eyewitnesses, so there's another side of observation skills. You can have observation skills made by eyewitnesses that then have to communicate what they see, what they hear, what they notice to investigators. And sometimes there's some discrepancies there. And we're going to actually talk about that in a whole nother lesson. So we're constantly gathering information through our surroundings, via our five senses, and the brain is naturally designed to filter this information. Uh, so we, we've I mentioned this earlier, the brain is not designed to hold all of the information that's processed or um, thrown at it on a daily basis. It is actually designed to throw out most of the information. And I'll show you a diagram in a second of how, um, how that happens. But uh, we have to work against the grain of the brain's natural processing to be able to withhold or retain information. So it is key to pay attention. Paying attention to detail takes conscious effort, but that is the key to remembering observations. So if we want to move those observations into our brain for retrieval, we have got to make sure and I say we, I mean, we as investigators have to make sure that we pay attention. And again, this takes conscious effort. Um, so there's two terms we're going to talk about in this lesson, observations and perceptions. And I want to go ahead and spend some time making sure that you're clear that these are not the same term. They have different meanings. And it is important that you understand that observations come before perceptions. So perceptions are made as a result of an observation. And I'll give you an example. All right, let's say every time you go into the bank, you get cold. Okay, so every time you've gone, gone in the bank um, dozens of times, every time you get cold, then you may believe that all banks are cold. In fact, you might even carry a jacket in your car and anytime before you go in the bank, you might grab that jacket because you know it's going to be cold. What you have done is you made observations. So the first time you went in the bank, it was cold. That was an observation. The next time it was cold, observation. The third time it was cold, observation. And then eventually you turn that observation into a perception. So now you perceive that all banks are cold based on your prior experiences, based on those previous observations. So the observation comes before the perception. All right, just real quick, what flavor ice cream is this? This is actually vanilla ice cream. So it is very likely, I'm not sure if this was the case with you, but it is probably likely you thought strawberry, bubblegum, cherry, some sort of uh, flavor that is associated with pink ice cream. So if you said strawberry, uh, cherry, bubblegum, then what you did is based on your previous observations, you perceived that all pink ice cream is going to have that particular flavor, when in fact, that was a faulty perception. So some perceptions can be faulty. This is vanilla ice cream. It's just colored pink. So you have to be careful. And investigators know this too. Investigators know that they must be careful. They have to train the brain against the grain. All right, so if you take a uh, psychology class, you dig into how the brain processes information. It is intriguing information. We don't have the time to, to go that deep today, so I'm going to do a very brief overview of how the brain takes observations and processes them, um, and I'm just going to cover enough information that it gives us what we need for, for forensics. All right, so information is bombarding us every day. It's coming through our five senses. It, senses. So we're seeing things. We taste things. We see things. We hear things. We smell things. We touch things. All of this information is coming through. We call this sensory input. Now, the brain is designed to get rid of those that sensory input. So it only lasts a few seconds and then it's gone. 
the only way it can move into the next compartment of our brain to be stored is we have to pay attention. So if we pay attention to any of that sensory input, then it moves into the next compartment of the brain for holding. And if we make a perception about that sensory input or those observations, then we move that memory into what's called short term. So it becomes a short term memory. Again, if you don't pay attention, if you don't make a perception, that information is lost. Now, most short term memories or most information that is uh, paid attention to and perceived is just stored as a short-term memory. Again, this can be short-term. So if that information is not used or rehearsed, it is lost. If that information is rehearsed, then it's just kind of, it just kind of sits there in short-term memory. Now, very few things that come towards us or bombard us on a daily basis, very, very few of those make it to long-term memory. But occasionally we do have memories that are considered long-term memories. Um, this, this would be like an example would be like a traumatic event, like an accident, or sometimes really happy or joyful memories like a wedding or the birth of a child. Um, those can be stored in long-term memory. Again, all of these things can be lost at any point in time, if not retrieved or rehearsed. Um, but this is sort of how the brain takes all the information that comes at it on a daily basis, thousands and thousands of pieces of information, and then moves it through the brain into short-term and long-term memory. Um, one more thing that we're not going to spend a lot of time on, um, but that you need to know is that the brain contains four lobes or regions. We're going to quickly go through each of the four lobes just so you know which lobe is responsible for what. So the frontal lobe is associated with reasoning, planning, parts of speech, emotions, and problem solving. And I am talking fast, so if you need to pause the video, feel free to do that. The parietal lobe is associated with movement, orientation, recognition, and perception of stimuli. You have the occipital lobe, which is associated with visual processing. And then the temporal lobe, which is like the auditory section, it is associated with perception, memory, and speech. And this is where our observation skills lesson ends. So we're going to end here for the day, and I'll see you in the next lesson.